Hello everyone, Panzer J back with a new video. And this is um, going to be my second uh, game of Axe and Allies 1940. So, in a different section of my house for this one, because I have uh, Historical Board Gaming's Global War 36 set up in my um, in the war room in the usual place. So, I had to find a room um, for this second game. So, um, based on some of the feedback and then going back and rereading some of the rules of X and Allies 1940, I realized I made a few mistakes in that first game. Um, not surprising considering I hadn't, uh, played X and Allies 1940 probably in about mm, five, six years or so. I think the last time I played um, was back in maybe 2014 or 15. So that's not surprising. A few of the mistakes made were just like um, not so much mistakes as just like uh, minor errors. Like um, one viewer pointed out that I landed an aircraft um, in a territory that had been taken that turn. Um, and that's, pr that's pretty much a basic rule in any of these um, games. Um, not just Axe and Allies, but in historical board gaming, global wars and all that. Um, newly uh, captured territories are not valid landing spots for aircraft. So I think a viewer had pointed out I landed a tactical bomber maybe somewhere in Russia in a territory that I just taken um, that turn. Um, and then also it was pointed out that um, as the British over here uh, in the in the Far East, the Far East Command here, I was um, taking territory uh, and adding it to the Far East Command income from China. So um, the rule for that, again, is pretty straightforward. Um, and it's typical in, in, again, most of these games is um, if you um, take territory, like let's say as the Axis... Um, they take um, an allied territory uh, belonging to whatever na whatever nation. Um, the Germans take a French territory. Uh, the Italians take a Russian territory. Japan takes a Chinese territory. Whatever the case may be, if a member of your alliance comes in and liberates that territory, um, that territory reverts back to the original owner um, of your alliance. So... Um, I didn't go back and review the video, so I'm not sure if China was completely knocked out of the game at that point. Um, if they were, that's the one exception to you being able to collect income for um, for yourself. So if China was still in the game at that point, and let's say uh, Britain came over uh, the Far East Command and took Yunnan, that um, liberated it from Japan, then that territory, <clears throat> even though there's no Chinese units in there and the Far East Command is the one that took that territory back, the money um, for that territory would go to China, not the Far East Command. And I think that's what the viewer was pointing out. Um, however, again, I didn't go back and review the video itself, but if the situation is um, with that rule, if that alliance member is is knocked out of the game. So again, let's take uh, uh, France. If Paris has fallen, Germany holds Paris, and uh, one of their allies, the U.S., British, um, were to come and take Normandy Bordeaux because of the fact that Paris is occupied and France is currently out of the game, obviously there's no way for the French to collect that income. So temporarily the liberating power would collect that money. And then if and when Paris is then liberated and France is back in the game, then that territory um, that was liberated by one of their allies reverts to uh, French control. So I'm not sure if that was the case in China, but I'm just going off of what the comment was. So that was a second um, error on my part. And the two biggest uh, mistakes I made, um, and that definitely um, could have affected 
uh, the outcome. I'm not sure how much one was in favor of the Allies and one was in favor of the Axis. So first, the uh, big mistake that favored the Allies is uh, the U.S. Um, has major factories on the board. So they've got a major factory in the eastern United States and in the central United States, as well as um, a major factory over here in the western United States. So they have three major factories to start the game, um, but they are neutral to start the game. And until the U.S. is at war, those major factories um, are only producing at minor factory status. And then once the United States um, comes into the conflict, they automatically at no cost um, are upgraded to the major factory. So um, this is obviously the initial setup of the game. I do have the major factories on the board because that is what they are, just they're temporarily minor. So I've just got to remember to um, go ahead and treat them as minor factories um, until the U.S. is actually in the conflict, which isn't um, only a couple of turns, um, even if the um, Axis stay away from um, uh, to actually attacking the United States. But anyways, so that's a couple of turns worth. And again, I didn't go back and review the video necessarily, but obviously the big difference is the major factories can produce 10 units. Um, the minor factories three. So that's a difference of seven units a turn. And without going back and having reviewed, I'm assuming that I had placed um, more than three units down as the United States in those factories to start the game. And again, they um, should be treated as minor factories until the U.S. enters uh, the conflict. And then again, at no cost to the United States, they're immediately upgraded to major factories. The other uh, big mistake I made, and again, this one um, probably, not probably, it definitely was beneficial to the Axis, was over here in the Far East. So as you can see, Japan is up here in Manchuria, they're here in Korea, and they're bordering the Soviet Union here in Amur. So, and then you've got Mongolia here. Uh, Mongolia doesn't currently have any units in it, but as you can see, as a neutral, they do have um, infantry uh, silhouettes in certain territories, and then a number next to that silhouette, which um, uh, s represents the number of infantry units you'd put on the board in each of those territories if Mongolia is activated. And... The big mistake there was um, Japan and the Soviet Union start the war. Um, they're at peace with one another. Um, but either side can attack the other at any time. But if they Japan attacks the Soviet Union in any territory that borders Mongolia, then Mongolia immediate, immediately aligns with the Soviet Union. You place... Um, the units on the board in Mongolia, in the Mongolian territories, which in this case would be a total of six infantry units in four different territories, and uh, Russia takes control of Mongolia. Um, and in the last game, as the Japanese, I did have Japan go in. Um, they invaded Amur. That is the territory, this Russian territory that they currently um, border with. And they went in there, and I forgot to... Um, place down the Mongolian infantry units and uh, go ahead and activate Mongolia uh, for the Soviet Union. So that was, um, again, I'm not sure how much of a game changer it would be. I mean, Japan um, in the last game had taken these Russian territories fairly easily and were in complete control here in the Far East. And you're only talking, um, you know, six infantry units. So I'm not sure how much of a um, difference it would have made and none of the Mongolian territories are worth any money either so but nonetheless it was still um, I'm completely messed up that Mongolian rule um, again it applies to unless again the readers can point out or the viewers can point out something um, different as far as the way I read it it's only if Japan attacks us or Russian territory that borders Mongolia so in theory um, they could use transports and come up here into the Soviet Far East and Siberia 
um, and attack the Russians, declare war on Russia, and those aren't territories that border Mongolia, so I would assume Mongolia would not be activated. Um, they could even come up to Sakha after taking Siberia, and again, that's a territory that doesn't border with Mongolia. It would only take effect once they go into a territory um, adjacent to Mongolia. So those were like, so that and the U.S. minor factories were the two big um mistakes I made in the game. So we'll get this second game started here and we'll do a turn by turn um, recap. So hopefully I won't be making any uh, major blunders. Definitely don't want to do anything that would influence the game one way or the other. So we'll see how it goes. Again, leave comments to any um, your thoughts and feelings, point out any possible mistakes. Um, again, minor things, um, I call them more errors in terms of uh, the example was landing the aircraft in a newly acquired territory. I mean, I seriously doubt I'll get through an entire game um, with absolutely no errors whatsoever. But like I said, as far as like major rule um, blunders, hope, hopefully I'll avoid that this game and uh, get you guys a, a clean game and see how it goes. So turn one in the books. Uh, and Axe and Allies Global 1940. A lot of typical moves, nothing getting too crazy at this point. Um, take a look in Europe. Germany did uh, the usual. They took out France, uh, Paris, Normandy, Bordeaux, and southern France. Took all three of the European uh, French territories there um, as Germany... Um, I know some people leave southern France for the Italians. I like to uh, make Germany as strong as possible. Um, they do carry uh, most of the heavy uh, workload for the Axis, especially in Europe. So Germany went ahead and took all three of those French territories. Um, activated uh, Bulgaria as well as uh, Finland in the Atlantic. Um, they came over and took out um, the Canadian um, naval units in 106. Um, they did take out the British fleet that was up off of Scotland, um, but they had left the combined uh, British and French fleet in 110. Um, because instead of trying to take out that, kind of spread themselves a little bit too thin, they actually came down here with a couple of U-boats and took out the cruiser in 91, just so that um, the British wouldn't have that cruiser available to come into the Med to um, um, attack the Italians. So the Germans gave up a little bit as far as attacking naval units um, around England um, in exchange for, you know, kind of helping out the Italians um, by taking out that cruiser in 91. Um, the Germans spent um, their $30 on a major complex they put down in Romania. So now um, they have a major complex on the border with the Soviet Union to go ahead and start putting units um, right away here on turn two. And everything else already started moving east. So um, already, as you can see, if you look at the border between Russia and Germany, Already quite a few German units um, on the border. And then that major complex obviously will be able to uh, pump out 10 units a turn um, coming up here on turn two. Um, the rest of the German units, all of the Air Force flew into Western Germany. Um, and the tanks that uh, and the mechs that had survived um, the battles in France, they'll start moving their way over so that on turn three, if Germany decides to attack Russia at that point, those units will have made their way over as well. That's pretty much it for Germany. As far as the Italians go, they actually have a decent naval presence left. Um, with that cruiser taken out, um, England didn't want to risk um, too much as far as um, their air assets. So Italy was lucky in terms of um, surviving with most of its navy intact right now. Um, they did land in uh, West Africa, um, took Algeria, and took Tunisia. 
Um, that was about it for Italy. They saved their $10. Um, they do have these two transports over here off of Tunisia and Algeria that they're exposed. They're by themselves, so the British will be able to take them out uh, on turn two. But at least they were able to get some units into Africa. They should be able to sweep out Morocco on the next turn so that they'll have all of uh, Western um, Africa under their control. They also came down in Central Africa and kind of spread out. Now, they did take uh, British Somaliland, which isn't worth any money, but one of the British bonuses is um, if they hold all of their original territories. So um, that is uh, was big, even though it's not worth any money, just in terms of denying um, the British starting on turn two um, that bonus. That's about it for the Axis on the European side. As far as the Allies go, again, the British um, didn't have didn't want to risk um, a whole lot in the Med. Um, Again, they had lost that cruiser in, nine, in CISO 91. They did land in Greece, so they activated Greece and got the men for that, although Greece might fall here to the Germans um, on turn two. They put a minor complex down in Egypt. Um, they bought a few items down here. They bought a strap bomber, and they also moved. They got a couple of planes, a couple of fighters, and a strap bomber in Gibraltar. So a couple of fighters in Malta, and they still have the tactical on this carrier outside of Egypt. So they have quite the Air Force in the Med, um, much more than what uh, the Italians can um, offer in the way of a defense. So the British have quite a, a good st offensive striking power in the Mediterranean. They also came up and took out, there was a lone German battleship that was left in C-Zone 111 here. So the British um, came up there took out that. The French brought a surviving destroyer up there to add to uh, the defense of those British uh, ships. Uh, the U.S. Uh, didn't really do anything. They moved some units around into the eastern United States, and that was about it on the European side. Um, the Russians went ahead, pulled most of their units back from the border with Germany, left just a single infantry in each territory. So it's not up so the Germans can't just walk in um, and blitz through. Um, they built some units up into uh, Leningrad and pulled back there. So they do have quite the stack of infantry, some planes up there as well. Um, not a whole heck of a lot going on for Russia right now. They're obviously not at war. So um, just kind of pulling back. Um, concentrating a couple of key territories down here in Stalingrad as well to hopefully maybe offer up some islands of resistance once the uh, German flood hits. In the uh, Pacific here, continuing the Allies for a minute, uh, the Russians did move some units into a moor, so they have a decent stack of infantry and a couple of our um, anti-aircraft guns, and they also moved up here into Siberia. Um, so just trying to populate some of the Far Eastern Russian territory, so um, maybe discourage the Japanese from attacking. Um, the U.S., um, again, if you remember, the U.S. factories are only miners to start uh, until the U.S. is actually at war, so they were only able to produce three units. So they built a um, carrier, um, a tactical bomber, and a battleship. So... The U.S. spent all their money in the Pacific this turn, trying to build up for the inevitable clash with the Japanese. Um, the Australians just turtled up down into um, Sydney, moved these ships around so that the Japanese aren't um, within striking distance. Uh, the Far East Command saved some money but built three infantry, pulled back some of their naval units, sent this destroyer up here as kind of a blocker, just as kind of cannon fodder, maybe. Pulled the battleship back to um, India itself. As far as the Chinese go, they had a rough first round, as, uh, as, as typical. Japan came into some of the empty territories and then won a couple battles. They did take Yunnan, the Japanese did, but um, the Chinese were able to take that back on their own turn, which is important. 
um, because now the Burma Road is completely open again so that uh, China can get that $6 bonus. Um, as far as the Axis, Japan, um, they went ahead and concentrated a bunch of units on the border with the Soviet Union. Um, now remember, if they attack um, this Amur, they attack this Russian territory, it does border Mongolia, so Japan would activate the Mongolians for Russia. So they probably don't want to do that, but we'll see how it plays out. Um, they made inroads into China. I believe they ended up taking like three or four Chinese territories. They also concentrated most of their air force um, on the Chinese mainland. They did not attack uh, the Western powers, so they're still not at war with um, either the United States or uh, the British Empire. So they stayed away from a, a, a J-1 attack. Um, they did concentrate a fleet down here in the South Pacific, maybe gearing up for a clash with uh, the Far East Command. And they also concentrated a big force, naval uh, task force, here in the Caroline Islands. They got three loaded carriers, a battleship, and a destroyer. Um, and again, that can go in a couple different places. That could um, make its way over to uh, the west coast of the United States. Could come down to Australia. Um, a few different places that can go. As far as purchases, Japan went ahead and bought a couple of transports. So now they got five total transports um, in Japanese home waters which can now start moving around some of the ground units. They got a stack of infantry, a couple of artillery, and a tank. So Japan's able to, um, will be able to move around units quite a bit here um, on turn two. Again, if they decide to um, possibly go up, they could come up here to the Soviet Far East, which would not trigger um, Mongolia aligning with Russia because it doesn't border a Mongolian territory. They can come up there. They can continue to reinforce and make inroads into China. They could come down, start taking some of the money islands here, um, maybe declare war on the Western powers. So Japan has a lot of options heading into turn two. Okay, so turn two is now in the books. And uh, the war hasn't expanded too much, at least on the European side of uh, the map. The Germans went ahead and took Greece. So the British had moved in there last turn and the Germans expelled them from the continent once again. Uh, besides that, they put down five tanks and five mechs in their major factory in Romania and then just continued to move stuff along the border. So Everything that was left over, minus these couple of artillery and a couple of men from the conquest of France, all moved east. Some tanks in greater southern Germany and some tanks and mechs uh, up in Germany itself, um, along with the entire German Air Force. So as you can see, the Germans have quite the invasion on the border with Russia from down south by um, Odessa, all the way up to uh, Finland. The Germans also purchased three subs, um, and they still have two subs left over here in the Atlantic. So not a lot of combat for Germany. Um, as far as the Italians go, um, they had taken out a lone Allied warship that was left in the Mata French uh, destroyer. The British had taken off and had vacated the Med um, on their turn. So Italy now gets that $5 bonus for having um, the Med free of Allied warships. But they came over and tried to take Morocco with an infantry and artillery and a, a strategic bomber. And they lost the man and the artillery. Um, they did take out the French soldier that was left there, but couldn't take the territory because they weren't going to sacrifice the strategic bomber. So Morocco is now open. Other than that, Italy purchased a couple of transports and a fighter. So now they have a decent navy built up uh, around southern Italy. They got three fighters that can scramble for protection. And now with those two transports, they can move some of the men and uh, the tank and the artillery that they have in southern Italy around. Um, as far as the U.S., they're still not in the conflict. So they dropped 
a aircraft carrier and a tactical bomber and then flew their fighter that was in eastern United States onto the carrier. So that's all they did on the eastern um, portion of the United States. As far as the British, they went ahead and took Anglo-Egypt Sudan uh, back from the Italians. Um, they put down two mechs and a man in Egypt. They had flown over here and taken out the two um, lone uh, Italian transport, the CZO-94, and then the fighters flew onto Malta. So they've got about four fighters and a, a strategic bomber on Malta, plus they're building up quite the force in Egypt now as well. Um, and they've got some units making their way up from um, the Union of South Africa. Um, didn't do a whole lot in Europe. Um, really nothing at all. They had bought also three destroyers they put down here. So they've got a decent fleet going. Three destroyers, a transport, a battleship, and a cruiser. Um, and that was pretty much it on the European side. Uh, the Russians, they built six tanks that they put down in Russia, in Moscow, and then everything else. They moved a couple more men up into Leningrad. But obviously, um, a German attack quite possibly happening here on turn three coming up. So uh, Russia bracing for that. Over in the Pacific, a little bit more action than on the uh, European side. Japan went ahead and declared war and attacked Russia. They came up and used their transports and all the men and a couple artillery they had in Japan itself, landed in the Soviet Far East, and then attacked Siberia, which the Russians had six infantry there. So um, they attacked Siberia with a bunch of men and artillery and some planes, and they did take quite a few losses, but they took Siberia. Um, and because they didn't attack a Russian territory that borders Mongolia, uh, the Mongolian rule um, is still not in effect. So um, Russia doesn't get to um, align um, Mo Mongolia and get all those units. So Japan stayed away from um, attacking a moor just because of that reason. So they did take a couple of bucks off of Russia as well as um, defeated six infantry. So not too bad. Um, that was a about all they did in the Far East. Then over in China, they continued to make inroads into China itself. They had taken Yunnan back, um, couple, took a couple other territories in northern China. So they've got the Chinese really backed up, really mostly into Sichuan, besides a couple territories with a single man. Uh, China did counterattack and took Yunnan back on their portion of round two, uh, but only survived with a single infantry. So. As you can see, Japan's got a decent amount of infantry and artillery, and then basically almost their entire air force is down in central China and can reach any of these Chinese territories that still hold uh, Japanese unit or Chinese units in it. So um, Japan's got quite a, a good offensive punch going in China. They also bought three mechanized that they put down in their minor factory on the Chinese mainland. Uh, besides that, they had also bought a carrier and a couple of subs they put down in Japan itself. Uh, this fleet down here didn't really move off of the Caroline Islands. They did bring a transport down, though. So now that transport can take those couple of infantry off the Caroline Islands and strike a couple of different places. And then they also moved this fleet down here into Java. So they are in position to strike maybe the Far East Command, maybe over here, um, this, Anz this small Anzac fleet. So Japan's got two big fleets spaced out that can go um, pretty much in any direction. Expecting that Japan will probably declare war on the Western Allies this turn three, considering the U.S. can enter the conflict at the end of this turn. So really no point in waiting any further. Um, so Japan's got a few different options. Um, as far as the Allies on the Pacific Theater, we already talked about uh, the Chinese. As far as the Far East Command, they built a fighter and three tanks. They also came over and landed in Borneo, so they got that $4. They got a destroyer here as a blocker so that the Japanese fleet can't reach this battleship and this care, uh, cruiser this turn. And down in India, with the units they built, they got a, a decent offensive punch. The Japanese really don't have a whole lot in Southeast Asia, so... Um, the Far East Command could definitely go on the offensive once they are at war with uh, Japan. As far as Anzac goes, there was really no place this fleet can escape to, so 
They're kind of just stuck down by South Australia. Um, didn't buy anything, save their money again. So they're up to $30 they can spend um, if they so choose on turn three. And then for the U.S., Again, since they're not at war, their minor factories or their factories are only minor at this point. So they purchased another uh, carrier and a tactical bomber, and then had a fighter in Western U.S. fly over onto that carrier. So now they got three loaded carriers over here in the Pacific. So not too bad for uh, the U.S. As you can see, they got a bunch of naval units there, so that really could um, compete with what Japan has in the Pacific. So we might see Japan. Uh, putting a bunch of uh, naval units on the board here in turn number three. That's the way things look economically. Uh, Germany up to uh, fifth, or forty-six dollars, and they also have bonuses. The U.S. still at fifty-two. Uh, Japan and Russia right around the mid thirties each, followed by Britain, Far East Command, and on down the line. So expecting the war to expand here on turn three, wouldn't be surprised to see a German invasion of Russia, as well as the Japanese uh, going on the offensive against possibly all of the Western allies. See what happens on turn three. Okay, turn three's all done here in uh, Axon Allies Global War 1940. And uh, the war has truly gone global as both the United States and the Soviet Union are now in uh, the conflict. So let's take a look at Europe first and Germany. They went ahead and invaded the Soviet Union here. So you can see all along the border with Russia, um, German units have invaded. Um, down on the southern portion of the front here, outside of Romania, there's a stack of German tanks and some mechs in Bessarabia. Um, the Russians pulled back um, from the Ukraine. That's about to fall on uh, turn four here. And the Germans did back up Romania with some more mechs and some more uh, tanks. Up in the central and northern sections of the front, again, the Germans uh, broke into eastern Poland and the Baltic states with quite a bit of force. There's a bunch of men, tanks. Um, some artillery mechs and um, most of the German air forces um, in Poland ready to support the advance up north. Um, the Germans did have a big stack of men over here just outside Leningrad, but the Russians did counterattack on their turn and um, it was up here in Karelia and they went ahead and took Karelia back. Now that kind of has opened the door um, so that this stack of um, men Russian infantry can go into uh, Finland and into Norway. The only problem is, is the German units here right outside of Leningrad probably are going to take Leningrad on this turn. Um, the Russians could have just holed up there, but the stack of German infantry in Karelia was about eight to ten men. So that and this force in the Baltic States would have just came in and crushed Leningrad anyway. So um, just to get some use out of the infantry they had there, Russia did take Karelia back. And again, Finland and Norway are now open. Um, but again, Leningrad will probably fall this turn. Um, besides that, the Germans built some more subs. So they've got five subs and a cruiser um, outside of western Germany. Um, they did put three men in uh, the minor complex they have in Paris. Starting to beef up the defenses for when the uh, Allies decide to land back. And that was about it for Germany. They're up to collecting uh, $48 minus bonuses. So if we take a look, um, the Russians, again, they had counterattacked, took Karelia. They built a bunch of tanks. So as you see in Moscow, they've got two stacks, about seven, eight tanks apiece. So they've got a decent um, counterattacking force. It just depends on how long it's going to take the Western allies to start applying pressure on Germany in Western Europe for that to, to make a difference. Because if you look along the border here, there's just some single Russian infantry units and that's about it. So Germany is going to continue the, the advance um, here on turn four. I expect Leningrad to fall, the Western Ukraine, Ukraine. So they're going to start taking some, uh, some big bites out of Russian territory and Russian, um, the Russian economy. Um, as far as Italy, they did pretty much nothing. They built a tr another transport and a tactical bomber. 
So they do have three transports ready to start moving some men around. Besides that, they um, did really absolutely nothing. The British took Tobruk and wiped out the Italian units there, which were like three infantry, a Mac, a tank, and artillery. So not insignificant. Um, they also built three men they put in Cairo. Um, and their entire air force landed after the battle in Tobruk, landed in Cairo. So the British have quite a bit of um, units in in Cairo. That's about four fighters, two strategic, and one tactical bomber. So they got quite the air force. They also came over here and took Ethiopia from the Italians. So now these last couple um, territories here are controlled by Italy with no units in them will fall to uh, Britain um, on turn number four here. Uh, the British did put a strategic bomber down in London, maybe to start bombing some of the German factories. Uh, the U.S. spent um, some money um, in the east here, um, in the eastern United States. They bought uh, three transports and a couple of men, so on turn four they can start moving some of these units around, possibly landing in Western Europe or down here in Africa, depending. Um, but they did bring a loaded carrier and a cruiser over here off the coast of um, England, and then the British moved their fleet back there too, so now it's combined Allied fleet. You got a battleship, uh, a couple cruisers, four destroyers, and a loaded carrier all together between uh, the Allies. So more than enough to offset um, the little bit of the German Navy that they got going. Um, that was about it on the European side of the map. Over here in the Pacific, Again, the U.S. is now fully uh, in the conflict. Uh, the Rush, the Japanese starting first, they went up and took a moor. Now, by taking that, they activated the Mongolian rule. So now all of Mongolia went um, Russia. And I put down um, the amount of infantry units that um, per territory. Um, the Japanese did come in and already took one of the Mongolian territories. So really, uh, the Russians didn't gain much. Um, just for um, getting Mongolia on their side. It was four infantry, and none of the territories are worth anything. So it really didn't hurt Japan whatsoever to uh, attack a, a territory adjacent to Mongolia and get the Mongolians on the uh, Russian side. So they're now up here in Amur in force. They've got about uh, eight infantry and, and artillery. So they're probably about to take Siberia here on turn four and finish off the Russians in the Far East, minus these few guys that got put down in Mongolia. Uh, in China, uh, the Japanese continue their inexorable march towards Sichuan. Um, J the Chinese kind of hold up. They did take the J J Japanese again, took Yunnan, and then it went back on the Chinese turn. But other than that, um, the Japanese are right at the door to Sichuan. They don't have a ton of ground units. There's four infantry and three artillery up here. But the main thing is they've got uh, a, a huge air force, three fighters, uh, two tacticals and two strategic bombers. That's probably enough to take Szechuan here on turn four. Um, also, the Japanese fleet that was over here in the Caroline Islands moved over and took the Philippines. This Japanese sub came over and took out the lone Far East Command transport. Uh, this sub and this destroyer took out a Far East Command destroyer. And then down here um, off the coast of South Australia, the uh, This Japanese fleet of a couple cruisers, a battleship, and a destroyer took out the three Anzac ships. So now Anzac has no uh, naval units on the board. Um, Japan did also buy a bunch of men, and they do have these four transports outside of Japanese home waters, so they can go ahead and start moving all those guys around. They did build another carrier um, and a couple of more subs. So all together, the Japanese now have... Uh, five loaded carriers in the Pacific. So pretty good offensive punch for uh, the Japanese. The U.S. brought most of their Navy over here to the Hawaiian Islands. That's three loaded carriers, a couple battleships, a couple of cruisers, a couple destroyers, and a sub, and a strategic bombers in Hawaii. So they've got quite um, the ability to strike at the Japanese there. And then they also built another carrier that's now loaded off of the west coast of the United States. And now that the U.S. is in the conflict, they get all their bonuses, so they collected 70 bucks this past turn. The Far East Command ventured out. They actually, um, the British sent a carrier and a destroyer over, and then the Far East Command built a cruiser, a destroyer, and a sub 
So they're trying to build up a little bit of a fleet. And they also ventured out with their units from um, India. So um, they came out one territory. That's a stack of about eight men, three tanks, an artillery, a tactical, and a fighter. Um, even though they left India pretty much defenseless, there's really the Japanese don't have the ability to get to India probably for several turns. They only have one transport down in the South Pacific right now. So that's why the Far East Command felt competent enough to venture out. And now they're going to start applying some pressure here in Southeast Asia on the Japanese. Um, the Japanese might have to build another factory down here to start pumping out some ground units and definitely start spending some money on the one complex they already have in China just to offset the uh, ground force that the Far East Command has. Uh, Australia didn't do a lot. They actually bought a couple of strategic bombers. No sense in buying any naval units right now just because they'd get picked off with what Japan has in the South Pacific. But they already had three fighters in Sydney and now with the two strategic bombers. They got a little bit of an air force that can maybe um, fly around and pick off a ship or two here off of the Japanese. Other than that, um, not much else to report. We'll see how things look at the end of turn number four. Turn four, now in the books, in Global 1940. Let's take a look in Europe first. So, in Europe, the Germans continue to inch their way closer to Moscow. Um, the Russians have a few infantry units, a single guy apiece, and a few territories adjacent to uh, German units. But other than that, everything's pretty much pulled back into Moscow. Uh, that's two stacks of tanks, so probably about 15 tanks total, about 15 men, a couple of fighters, and a tactical. So not a bad defense, but uh, the Germans got quite a bit um, already fairly deep into Russia. Um, you, got a, you got two stacks of tanks down here, about a dozen tanks, about another dozen mechs, about half a dozen men up in Novgorod slash Leningrad. You got about six tanks, four mechs, about 10 guys, and some artillery. And the Germans have like four tacticals and another like 10 mechs in Romania ready to move on into Russia. So Russia's getting bottled up pretty good. Um, they did take Finland, so they've got about five men and an artillery piece there. Um, but that those Russian units are kind of cut off from the rest of Russia here with the Germans having taken Leningrad. So... Things looking pretty bleak. Russia's down to tw collecting $28. So not so good um, on the Eastern Front for the Allies. Germany's up to collecting, uh, I believe, $53, not counting bonuses. So because things are going so good on the uh, Eastern Front for Germany, they've started actually uh, beefing up the West already, even though... Uh, the Western Allies aren't in any position to land in Europe. Germany's already starting to invest in the defense of fortress Europe. So in Paris, you've got about five men, about five artillery, a couple of strategic bombers, and about four or five fighters. So um, Germany looks like they might have enough units on the Eastern Front to take Moscow as is. So I wouldn't be surprised if Germany continues to uh, pump units into Paris and Western Germany, building up the defenses even more there, and possibly adding more to the Kriegsmarine here. You got five subs and a cruiser and a uh, transport. So I wouldn't be surprised if they sink money into, into the Navy as well. So things looking uh, pretty robust for Germany. Um, as far as their Axis partner, the Italians, not so good. Um, the U.S. had come down. They're finally in the conflict, so they had landed in Morocco with a decent force. Four infantry, two mechs, an artillery, and a tank. And they've got a loaded carrier and a cruiser and the transports off of Rio de Oro right there. Um, the British built three fighters, so they've got about seven or eight fighters, a couple of strategic bombers, and a tactical bomber in Alexandria. So they got a bunch of um, air units in North Africa. Definitely nothing the Italians can compete with. So the Italians brought their three transports loaded 
and their entire navy over off of Morocco landed there and was able to take Morocco back from the U.S. Um, but as you can see, um, Italy's down to a to grand total of seven ground units in North Africa. And with um, the U.S. and the British at one end of the Med and this uh, massive British force highlighted by their Air Force um, at the other end of the Med, it's really just a matter of probably a turn or two before uh, the Allies squeeze the Italians out of North Africa. The British also have units coming up from uh, Central Africa as well. So Italy saved their money this turn, so they'll have about all together with what they collected this turn, a little over $30 to spend next turn. But um, I don't think the Italian Navy's long for the world either. You got this British fleet coming into the Med probably on Britain's next turn, plus, again, this huge air force that they got. So you're probably talking about the Italian Navy getting wiped out here on turn five and Italy being bottled up just to Italy itself. But it might not matter with how well Germany's playing. Um, again, the British devoted all their money to North Africa. Um, not much else going on in the European theater. Over in the Pacific, had a huge naval air battle um, in the waters of Japan. Uh, the Japanese had three loaded carriers, a couple of battleships, a destroyer, three subs, and I believe three fighters they scrambled. The U.S. came over with like three loaded carriers, a couple of battleships, uh, a couple of subs, a couple of cruisers, like four destroyers, as well as a strategic bomber. And they completely wiped out the uh, Japanese fleet and air force. So as you can see, Japan is pretty much defenseless. Both of those U.S. battleships are damaged. That's why they're on their side. And then the planes flew back to Midway. And a couple of planes had landed on this carrier that came over from the western United States. So if you look um, in the North Pacific, there's absolutely no Japanese ships whatsoever. So Japan is pretty much wide open. The only problem is the U.S. doesn't. They do have a couple of transports down here. But Japan will definitely drop men down into uh, Tokyo before the U.S. can get there. So it'd probably take a couple of turns for the U.S. build up enough to actually threaten Tokyo itself. But at least they um, took out um, any of the J Japanese naval units in the North and Central Pacific. Um, besides that, the U.S. spent most of their money in the Pacific. They built another carrier, a couple of cruisers, and a destroyer. Uh, the Japanese... Um, moved a little bit further into Manchuria, moved, took a couple more uh, Soviet Far Eastern territories. So the Russians are down to just three men in Mongolia and the entire Far East. So that's almost completely Japanese. The Japanese went ahead and finished off the conquest of China. So China has been completely eliminated. All territories are now Japanese. Um, the Japanese also brought four Transports down from Tokyo, dropped off six men, a tank, and an artillery in French Indochina. And they concentrated a sizable air force there as well. So now they've got an offensive punch to push back on uh, the Far East Command. Uh, the Japanese also still have a decent naval presence down over here in the Indian Ocean. Three loaded carriers and then a battleship, a couple of cruisers, and a, destroy and a destroyer over here off of Java. So neither the Far East Command nor ANZAC have any ships here in the Pacific. Um, so Japan can, if they want to, use these transports over here to start taking up these money islands. Um, Japan's already collecting, I think, $52. So um, they're in a position to take um, pretty much all these money islands, maybe even Malaya this turn. So that'll definitely increase the Japanese income quite a bit. The Far East Command had ventured out, but then once Japan put all that stuff in French Indochina... They didn't want to take the chance of advancing any further into, say, Shan State or Siam, so they pulled back to um, India itself. Uh, the Far East Command, or excuse me, Anzac had come out. The Japanese had a lone transport, so they used a bomber to take that out, and then they built a couple of bombers themselves. So Anzac's got a decent air force going as well. They've got uh, four bombers and about three fighters. So. Um, if the Japanese venture too close to Australia with any ships, um, the, the uh, Australians can go ahead and start picking them off like they did the transport this last turn. So we'll see how things look after turn five. So turn five is now in the books, 
and some interesting developments. Start over here in the Pacific first. So if you remember from turn four, the U.S. had come over and there was a major naval uh, and air engagement in the Japanese home waters. And the U.S. had completely wiped out the Japanese Air Force and Navy, and there were two damaged U.S. battleships remaining. Um, the Japanese, because the U.S. did have some units that could strike from Hawaii, they went ahead and built 10 infantry plus moved two fighters back to Japan itself to protect Tokyo. Um, besides that, the Japanese took all the money islands down in the South Pacific, they still have quite a bit of a naval presence down there. They got three loaded carriers and a few other um, ships, some transports and cruisers around the Money Islands. Um, they also put three tanks down in French Indochina. Um, Ch China itself is completely um, under Japanese control. So the U.S., seeing that Japan is now up to... Um, almost $70, and that the Japanese Navy was pulled out of position down in the South Pacific, even though it was a gamble, the U.S. went ahead and attacked Tokyo anyways, figuring if they could take out Tokyo, obviously gain the nearly $70 the Japanese have, um, and the Japanese really wouldn't be in a position to take Tokyo back for several turns. Everything was pulled down in the South Pacific, so it was a gamble. It was probably about 60-40 that Japan would win, but the war in general is turning against the Allies, so U.S. thought, well, might as well give it a chance, and didn't work out. The U.S. attacked with, they had two transports, they had two men, a mech, an artillery. The two damaged battleships prov provided offshore bombardment, and then there was a total of five U.S. planes. One of, the, one of the six they attacked with had gotten shot down. The shore bombardment did one damage, but as you can see, Japan is still standing. Tokyo is still under Japanese control with three infantry and two fighters. Um, a couple U.S. planes had pulled back. So that didn't work out for the U.S. And if we take a look at the Pacific in general, it's pretty much all Japanese now. Like I said, they're up to, I believe, $68 without bonuses. So uh, Japan's pretty much firmly in control. And the U.S. doesn't really have anything to threaten Tokyo with. Um at all right now. So Japan is going to be able to uh, beef up the defenses of Tokyo and continu continue the offensive in the South Pacific. Um, as far as the rest of the Allies, Far East Command built a fighter and a tactical bomber. So they got some decent offensive pu punch in India itself, but they're kind of backed up there. Um, Anzac, the Australians, saved their money, but as you can see, They've got quite the Air Force of Sydney. That's four strategic bombers and I believe four fighters. So again, if the Japanese were able to, uh, were to, uh, kind of venture out around Australia itself, um, the Australians have a decent Air Force to be able to pick off some of the, uh, Japanese, pl uh, ships. So, uh, Anzac nor the Far East Commander really any immediate danger, but again, um, almost all of the Soviet Far East is under Japanese control. All of China is. And now, with no threat from the U.S., probably for several turns to come, um, Japan can really start uh, applying pressure on the remaining uh, allies in the Pacific. In Europe, this actually side of the, of the globe looks a little bit better for the uh, allies. Let's take a look at Russia first. So Russia was backed up into Moscow, and um, this territory adjacent to Moscow here contained a bunch of German units, about 12 mechs, about six men, about six tanks. So instead of just staying in Moscow and waiting for the inevitable German attack, the Russians actually came out and attacked and took that territory back, and the rolls went uh, their way. They still have two st stacks of nine tanks each in that territory. And they put 10 men down in Moscow itself. So the Germans are definitely going to approach Moscow from the north here with this force. Probably take Smolensk and Vologda on this turn. So they'll have a couple of territories adjacent to Moscow. They might be able to take out this territory here with all these Russian tanks. They've got these 10 mechs here, four strategic uh, bombers. They got some tanks down here. 
plus some of the units from this territory up north can go Belarus and then down there as well. They also got two um, strategic bombers in the Baltic states. So I think Germany's going to go in there and try to take out all those Russian tanks. But if they do succeed, there's probably not going to be much left. So uh, the German forces on the Eastern Front definitely um, got degraded this last turn by Russia. So Russia might actually hold on. Um, Germany's probably going to have to put units in Romania this turn um, to um, try to take out Moscow within the next couple of turns. So um, things tilted a little bit in the Allied favor on the Russian front. Besides that, Germany had built some more fighters, so Paris is well defended. Um, they also have more U-boats. That's a total of like 12 U-boats along with a cruiser. So the Germans are probably going to come out on this turn with this Navy. And if you look at the Atlantic, there's not a whole lot of Allied ships at all in the Atlantic. So that German fleet, mostly U-boats, is going to be able to do some damage. Um, the Western Allies, um, not even remotely uh, threatening Western Europe at all. So that's the good news for Germany. Italy um, had a bad turn. This Italian fleet that was over here got taken out with a combination of British uh, air and naval power. Over by Cairo, the British built two cruiser or uh, two transports and a carrier. So now they have two transports and two loaded carriers off of Cairo. And there's no Italian ships left in the Med. So now Rome, uh, the Italians in general, the Italian mainland, pretty much at the mercy of the British. They can go anywhere they want in the Med. The Italians are down to just a couple of territories in northern Italy and are only collecting $11. So they build just all men they put in Rome and northern Italy. Germany is going to probably have to come down. So that's a stack of about seven fighters. So I can see Germany bringing all them down to Rome itself to beef up Rome's defenses. And then the men and the artillery in Paris will probably come down one space to northern Italy. So with the Germans backing up Italy, I don't know that Rome would fall. Uh, anytime soon, but at least the British have got pretty much complete control of Africa as well as having battled the Italians up into Italy itself. Um, so I think on the European side of the map, it's just going to be a question of if Germany has got enough units right now on the Russian front to take Moscow, um, because Italy is now bottled up to almost like not contributing whatsoever for the Axis. So I think that the game is still... Um, in uh, the Axis's favor, but um, especially on the European side of the map, a good turn five uh, for the Allies. Okay, well, turn six has come to an end, and um, things look like they are going to end up going the way of the Axis. Uh, we start over here in Europe. So on the last turn, the Russians had come out and taken Bryansk back. And they still had two stacks of a total of about 18 tanks left over. Uh, the Germans couldn't let that stand. So they counterattacked, took Bryansk back, destroyed all those Russian tanks. And then on uh, Russia's portion of turn six, they came back, took Bryansk back. The main thing, though is Moscow is now down to about 15 infantry, a couple of fighters, and a tactical. And Germany can reach Moscow on this next turn uh, with a total of about four tanks, about 10 infantry, three artillery, um, about five tacticals, eight fighters, and two strategic bombers. So Moscow will probably fall here on turn seven, and Russia won't have anything that'll be able to take Moscow back. Um, the Germans um, on their portion of turn six, besides uh, taking Bryansk back and wiping out that uh, large uh, stack of Russian tanks, they also brought their f fighters that they had based in Paris as far as they could. Um, and they also put down 10 uh, tanks in Romania. Now they're not going to be able to reach Moscow anytime soon. So the Germans might actually use them to beef up Italy, which we'll talk about in a second. So right now, um, it's kind of a slugfest on the Eastern Front, both sides giving and receiving. But like I said, I think uh, Moscow will fall this turn. Here's seven. Germany's definitely going to attempt it. 
So unless the Russian AA guns get really lucky and take out a bunch of uh, German planes, Moscow will probably fall. Um, and again, Russia doesn't have anything. They've got a couple of men scattered around, and that's it. So if Moscow does fall, Russia will be pretty much eliminated with no chance of uh, coming back into the game. So that's the good news um, for the Axis as far as the European side. These 11 German subs um, left um, the shores of Germany, and now they're up by um, Scotland, so ready to make their presence felt in the Atlantic. And then the Germans completely evacuated Paris, um, A, because the Western Allies are not even close to invading Europe, and B, because Italy's in such rough shape. So that stack of German artillery and men headed to northern Italy. And um, also on this turn, I wouldn't be surprised if Germany pulls back these tanks they just put in Romania, maybe come over here to greater southern Germany, um, because Italy could quite possibly be invaded on uh, this turn seven. Italy itself down to just collecting um, $8.00. And they're holed up in Rome. They brought all their units down from northern Italy, built three more infantry. So they have all together probably about 15, 18 infantry, uh, four anti-aircraft, three fighters, a tactical, and a strategic, all in uh, Rome. As far as the U.S., they came over with some transports, two loaded carriers, and eight infantry. So they're off the coast of Morocco here. So they actually can land... Um, in either southern France or Italy this turn. They also built 10 destroyers and put them off the east coast of the United States to uh, counter the uh, German subs that are over by Scotland now. As far as the British go, they continue their stranglehold on the Mediterranean and North Africa. They finished taking out all the Italian units in North Africa, so now all this belongs to Great Britain. And if you look in the Med, there is a lot of ships and a lot of planes the British have. They built a couple of more transports, three in Cairo. So now altogether they got six transports in the Med, two loaded carriers, a battleship, a cruiser and destroyer, and they have a bunch of planes. There's four fighters on the two carriers, and then on Malta, you've got um, three strategic bombers, a tactical bomber, and five more fighters. So Britain has quite the Air Force going in the Med. Um, and the Western Allies have to start uh, pushing things a little bit just because Germany's up to uh, like $65 they're collecting. So uh, not counting bonuses. And with Moscow almost definitely falling this turn, um, Germany's just going to become too strong economically. So the Western Allies pretty much got to make a push this turn seven. So I would expect that maybe the U.S. and uh, who goes before Britain each turn to land somewhere, like I said, either southern France or Italy, and then the British to follow up with um, their own landing force and see if they can at least take Italy out of the war and help a little bit. But again, Germany probably going to bring these tanks over. And with the units they already have in northern Italy, that's quite a, a counterattack force on turn eight if that was to happen. So not sure the Western Allies would be able to hold, uh, but they got to try something at, at this point. As far as the Pacific go, things kind of just as bleak for the Western Allies. Um, if we remember from the turn before, the U.S. had attempted to take out the Japanese and take Tokyo. That didn't go their way. So the U.S. pulled back. They set up some blockers, a couple of cruisers, and a destroyer to protect their damaged battleships and their carriers that moved back to Midway. Um, so the Japanese won't be able to get to those forces. Kind of sucks the U.S. has to uh, sacrifice a couple of cruisers, but um, the battleships and the carriers are more important. So those units will be able to escape from Midway, but um, the U.S. spent their entire build in eastern on the eastern um, United States because of the German U-boat threat now. So no money went into the Pacific. So the U.S. is kind of bare and not even remotely in a position to um, not only threaten Tokyo, but really um, offer much resistance as far as naval presence in the Pacific at all. Um, the Japanese, 
moved up here some units in the Far East. So they're now um, ready to clash with the last of the Russian units that are in the Far East. And if they take them out, then that's just a free run to get some of these uh, dollar territories that are completely um, empty of uh, Russian units. China continues to be under complete Japanese control. The Japanese put three tanks down in uh, French Indochina, so they're gearing up for invasion of India. Probably still a couple of turns away, um, but the Japanese also have three loaded carriers, so quite a bit of an Air Force presence in Southeast Asia as well. Um, they also came over and took um, Dutch New Guinea and New Guinea, not that they were worth anything, but that now takes away the $10 bonus for Australia. And Australia was actually bringing in quite a bit of money each turn because of bonuses. So um, not a $10 bonus, but a $5 bonus. So they took at least that portion of it away um, for uh, the Australians by uh, having those two territories. Also, because one of them was an original uh, Australian territory that actually took away the other bonus. So it was actually $10 total worth of bonuses Australia no longer getting. Um, they had to sacrifice the transports because Australia came out and took out both those defenseless transports. But the main thing is they took away the bonus for Australia. So they were happy with sacrificing those couple of transports. Um, the Far East Command just built four infantry. So they do have quite a bit of force in India, but they're all they're pretty much backed up into India. So Japan is kind of content right now just to have them bottled up there and slowly uh, built up. And Japan obviously is collecting way more money. They're up to almost uh, $70, not counting bonuses. So um, the Japanese also built a sub and seven destroyers in the Japanese home waters. So they're starting to build their Navy back up to eventually go after what the remnants of the U.S. fleet. Australia, they built three fighters. They do have a nice air force down in Sydney. Uh, six fighters, three strategic, and one tactical bomber. And again, they've been using that to pick off um, lone Japanese ships that venture close to Australia. Um, but other than that, they have no naval presence. So again, kind of like with the Far East Command, they're just bottled up um, in uh, their capital. That's how things look after six turns. So turn seven is complete, and um, the game continues to uh, tilt uh, heavily in the Axis favor, um, almost ready to call it a game, seven turns in. Um, it's getting pretty close there, um, especially on the Pacific side of the map. If we take a look at the Pacific first, uh, Japan built some more tanks down into French Indochina, moved up to Burma. So they've got the Far East Command battled up right in India. And they do have a decent defense force there. They probably got upwards of 25, maybe 30 men, three tanks, a couple of fighters, and a couple of strategic bombers and artillery. Uh, but Japan's got a stack of about a dozen tanks maybe coming. Um, three loaded carriers with some tacticals and fighters, some more uh, tacticals and strategic bombers here. So uh, the tanks won't be able to reach India on this next turn, but I can see uh, possibly um, turn nine, the attack on India. Um, so Japan's got complete control of um, Southeast Asia. Up north in the Far East, Japan moved up one more space because Russians pulled back, which we'll talk about that in a second. And as you can see, they already own all of China and all of the Far Eastern Russian territories. And in the Pacific, the U.S. had put up blockers to protect their damaged battleships and their couple of carriers that worked. But Japan took out those blockers. And now you can see Japan sunk most of their money in building up their navy. Plus, they had brought some ships up from Hanan or excuse me, off of uh, Quang Tung, ships came up. So Japan's already building up quite the naval presence. The U.S. just continuing to retreat. They were at midway, so they only could move two spaces. So they're just trying to keep these ships alive. The battleships haven't even been able to be repaired yet. Uh, but as you can see, the U.S. has almost nothing on the Pacific side of the map. So even just this fairly moderate Japanese fleet is going to probably be 
um, more than enough to take out uh, the U.S. and continue to apply pressure on them, maybe at some point even threatening the Western United States. Australia, because Japan kind of vacated all of um, the South Pacific, went ahead and built a cruiser and a transport. So now on their next turn, they're thinking about um, moving out and taking some of these islands back that are uh, lightly defended. They, they still have quite a bit of a Air Force presence, fighters and uh, strategic bombers. So they definitely have the air power along with even just a couple of ground units to start taking some of these islands back. But it might be a little bit, a little, uh, too little, too late possibly um, as far as the Pacific goes. Japan's up to collecting uh, $71 minus bonuses. So they're, they're way up there. On the European side, um, a little bit of better news for the uh, Western Allies, but not much. So we had the big battle in Moscow, and as you can see, it was really, really close. Um, the Germans took Moscow, but with one tank, and they had a couple of tacticals and a strategic that since flew um, down um, into Stalingrad. So if you look at the Eastern Front, I mean, there's no Russian units but the Germans are almost totally bare as well. So um, the Germans did accomplish their goal. They took Moscow, but it took pretty much everything they had. Um, the Russians, that's why the Russians pulled back in the Far East to go ahead and try to get to Moscow. Probably not going to happen. These infantry can only move one a turn. So, And the Germans do have the minor factory that... Um, that they captured by getting Moscow. So not likely to happen, but no other choice. Down here, these Russian units pulled back. It was three infantry. They weren't going to do any damage. Pulled back into the Mideast to maybe um, team up with some of the, the British units down here. The Germans then spent all their money building tanks and mechs in Germany and West Germany. So they've got quite the offensive punch and the 10 tanks they had built the turn before that went in Romania since Moscow fell, they came over here. So now the Germans got a couple of different stacks of 10 tanks each, a bunch of artillery, some infantry, and some mechs. Uh, the good news for the Allies is they landed a couple of different places in the soft underbelly of Europe. The Americans landed in southern France with eight infantry, and the British landed both in Greece and Albania. Um, they've got a total of about six men, a couple of artillery, a tank, and a mech. Um, the British still also have massive air power sitting on Malta, so they can project out into um, um, southern Europe as well to add an offensive punch to the British. Um, the Italians didn't buy anything this turn, and the Germans had moved some infantry down. So as you can see, Rome has a ton of stuff in it, um, mostly men. Well, that's probably about 25 to 30 men, three fighters, a tactical, a strategic, and four anti-aircraft. So that's why the Allies didn't go for Rome. There was no way they were going to be able to get through that. Um, they just didn't have the ground units to back up the Air Force the British have to be able to take Rome. So that's why they landed. So they landed in a couple of spots, but the problem is, again, kind of like in the Pacific, I think it's a little bit um, too late for the Allies because the Germans... This attack here on southern France, these eight U.S. infantry, um, the two stacks of 10 tanks each in greater southern Germany and western Germany both can reach this turn, so they're going to wipe them out. Um, the Germans can't necessarily reach over here yet, but they've got the major factor in Romania. They can drop 10 men or 10 of whatever they want. They can start moving some of the stuff in Germany proper down. So it, there's just like no way that the um, Western Allies are going to be able to hold any of those things, I don't think. Um, but it was a, a, the point was Germany was also up to around $65 or so. So obviously just sitting back and doing nothing wasn't going to work. It would have just been a slower death. So the U.S. and the British landed, probably not going to do a whole heck of a lot. The British did buy three more men that they put down in Cairo that they can transport over, and then also three strategic bombers. The U.S. built some men and four strategic bombers, so they planned on bringing the strategic bombers over, land them in London, and then be able to attack into France. But by then, this U.S. force will pretty much definitely be wiped out. The British um, and the Americans combine their fleets over here. That's about 12, 13 destroyers. So the Germans had pulled back their subs earlier. So at least they're containing the subs. 
So the British could theoretically build some transports next turn and start bringing stuff over since they've kind of got the U-boats cornered. Um, but again, Germany's collecting so much money and they've got so many complexes in Europe to drop stuff. I really don't think it's going to matter too much. But we'll go ahead and play another turn, maybe a couple more. Um, probably if uh, the Germans do go ahead and expel the Allies from Europe this turn, and then maybe two turns from now if uh, the Japanese do come over and end up taking India, that'll probably, if it doesn't officially end the game in terms of victory cities, it'll probably at least uh, end any real chance the Allies have. So we'll see what happens after turn eight. So just finished turn eight. And things are pretty much coming to a head as far as the end of the game, it looks like. Um, over here in Europe, as expected, the Germans came over with about 14 tanks and took out southern France, the U.S. infantry that had landed. The Germans did take quite a few hits. They lost about six or seven tanks, but now the U.S. have been expelled from the continent. And... Uh, not much that they can bring over anytime soon. Um, Germany went ahead and built a bunch of infantry, 10 infantry they put in Romania, 10 tanks they put in Germany, five men they put in West Germany. They also brought some stuff down, some tanks and some mechs from greater southern Germany and Germany itself. So now Romania has got a bunch of units there. Uh, 10 tanks, about 7 max, 10 men, a couple of tacticals, a couple of strategic bombers. So they've now effectively uh, kind of blockaded the British down into the Balkans there. Really not much the British can do. I don't really think you're going to break through Romania. Um, besides that, the Germans took a the Urals that was empty up in Russia and then moved down to the Caucasus and now they're at the the doorstep to um, the Mideast with just two tanks and a man. Um, their subs backed off again because of the destroyer present the Western Allies got going on. That was pretty much it for Germany. Um, as far as the U.S., again, they got expelled from southern France. They built a couple of strategic bombers on this side of the map. They flew four strategic bombers over to London. And they've started moving this fleet back to the U.S. to pick up these eight men that they've got. They also moved their Pacific fleet, what's left of it, which is pretty much in shambles. Those two battleships still have not been able to be repaired. That moved over um, from the Pacific. That's it for the U.S. Um, for the British, they went ahead and they sent a man up into uh, Bulgaria. They have a man in Albania, so they kind of got a blocker there. And they're all, and all of their main units are concentrating in Greece. So they have about 10 men, 11 fighters, a couple of tanks, a couple of artillery, a couple of mechs, and I think three strategic bombers and one tackle bomber. So that's quite a bit. And if this was earlier in the game, maybe it would make a difference, but I really don't see how, um, if it's an arms race, the Germans can just build way more than the British can get over there. Not sure Germany will come down from Romania this turn, but probably only a matter of another turn or so. And the Germans will go into um, start trying to take the, the British out of Greece. So I just don't think the British, I mean, they can keep ferrying stuff over. They can put three units down a turn here in Egypt. They got a bunch of transports to bring them over, kind of ferry them over. That's not the problem. It's just that three units per turn compared to the 10 Germany can put in Romania, not to mention elsewhere in Europe. It's just, it's just not... Uh, viable long term I don't think for the British. They did come over and take three strategic bombers and bomb Germany. I got those chips underneath the uh, complex representing the damage so the Germans actually did get lucky and shoot down one of the strategic bombers and the two remaining bombers did 11 worth of damage. So the Germans would have to pay that off before they can put anything down there. Um, so a little bit of a moral victory I guess but Income-wise, again, Germany is like doubling uh, the British at this point. So Italy didn't do a thing, um, just stayed in Rome and saved money. They're only da they're down to like seven bucks, so they're basically, in for all intents and purposes, not even really in the game. They're just making sure Rome doesn't fall. That's pretty much it. Um, on the Pacific side, um, again, things look pretty much just as bleak for 
the Western Allies. First, let's start in the Pacific. Um, the Japanese went ahead and came down into Hawaii. Now they don't actually, they didn't actually take Hawaii because they have no ground units, but they've got a pretty good naval presence in the Hawaiian Islands. And they also went up out off of the Aleutian Islands up here with some destroyers, a sub and two loaded carriers. They also put down two transports, a battleship and a sub. So now the four men in Tokyo were able to move this next turn. They could come up to Alaska. They could more likely probably come down here to Hawaii. Um, Japan also moved up one more territory in uh, Russia, so that took another buck. And that was pretty much it for the Japanese turn. Uh, the U.S. went ahead, and because they can see, obviously, Japan's um, getting close to Alaska here, and with the two transports they put down, the U.S. responded by putting 10 tanks down in the western United States. But, you know, it's trouble for the United States when they're having to spend their money to defend uh, the Western United States because Japan is um, on the march. So definitely not a good sign for the uh, Allies. Down in Australia, the Australians came out with a transport a cruiser and some of their bombers, and they took New Guinea without a loss. So now they can just come over and take Dutch New Guinea back um, this next turn, which will give them a $5 bonus back. But really, those these are just like, uh, pinpricks to the uh, Japanese Empire, not really doing a whole heck of a lot. And then the big confrontation was over here outside of India. So the Far East Command, uh, the Japanese had moved up to Burma. So at that point, they had like four men, two max, three artillery, um, I think 11 tanks, five tacticals, and three fighters. And the Japanese also had bought three strategic bombers this last turn, moved their other two strategic bombers back. So they had five, they do have five strategic bombers sitting in French Indochina. So all that would have attacked India this turn nine. So the Far East Command thought, well, what the heck? Let's go ahead, attack Burma. If we can wipe out Burma, then the Japanese have no ground units left in Southeast Asia. It'd give them a breathing breathing room maybe of a couple of turns to like build up a little bit and the battle did not go the Far East Command's way. They attacked with uh, two fighters, two tacticals, an artillery, three tanks and I believe around 25 men and the beginning of the battle went pretty good. The Far East Command hit on a lot of the first turn rolls and the Japanese tanks on turn one missed 10 out of 11 um, rolls. Uh, but it gradually went Japan's way, and the British, the Far East Command, finally retreated with just a single uh, fighter left. So they did whittle Japan down. They have just one ground unit left in Burma, but with this Air Force, um, they should just be able to roll into uh, India this next turn. The British just have uh, three anti-aircraft, a fighter, and I think four men. So, And the Japanese can afford to take their... Uh, aircraft as casualties just as long as the tank survives and they take India because there's nothing um, down um, in this area that the uh, Western Allies can come back and, and retake India. So I think we're going to see the fall of India here on turn nine and that probably will in essence uh, finish off the game. So turn nine is finished and so is the game. Um, it's being called for an Axis victory. Uh, Japan has taken um, six of the eight uh, capitals, victory cities on the Pacific side. Uh, the, ally, uh, the Axis on the European side hold five. Um, so that's 11 total. So um, I believe the uh, for global it might be 12 that you have to hold. But it's going to be called for an Axis victory nonetheless. The, like I said, the Japanese do have the six of the eight they need on the Pacific side. Rome just fell, so the British did a last-ditch effort and did end up taking Rome. Um, but if you look, they have a single tank left, and on Germany's turn, they can bring down this stack of uh, seven tanks, one, two, down in southern Italy. they got a bunch of planes. Um, they're going to start moving some other stuff over. All of these tanks can go one, two to be in northern Italy. So um, the British definitely are not going to hold Rome uh, this turn. 
uh, turn 10, the Germans will take it right back. And there's really nothing in the Mediterranean. Um, the British could come over with these three tanks and this man, and they do have a little bit of an air force left, three strategic bombers and four fighters, but it's not a ton. Uh, the Germans would have at least seven, eight tanks there. So, um, and again, even if by some miracle they took, the British took Rome back here on then turn number 10, uh, the Germans will have moved a bunch of stuff over into Northern Italy on turn nine. So it would definitely fall for good, um, on turn 11 and be secure. So, um, and again, the British have no transports at all over by England, so they're not going to be able to land back in Europe. The U.S. do have a bunch of transports over here, but it's going to take one turn. Um, it's going to take two turns before they even get to Europe. So um, there's really nothing the uh, Allies can do on the European side. Um, none of the remaining five victory uh, cities um, that are in Axis control, Paris, Berlin, Leningrad, Moscow, Stalingrad, none of those five are even in remote danger. Um, so like I said, it'd only be like maybe another turn to make it official. Um, on the Pacific side, things are even more bleak. Again, the Japanese took two victory cities this turn. Calcutta fell, and so did Honolulu. So that gives them six of the eight. The only two that are not in their control are San Francisco and uh, Sydney. Um as you can see, Japan has complete control of the Pacific. They've got now three fleets built up, one off the Aleutian Islands, one in Hawaii, and one in the Japanese home waters. Um, they hardly have anything left in mainland China at all. It took almost everything they had to finish off Calcutta. But as you can see, the Allies have absolutely nothing here. So all of China, all of the Far Eastern Soviet territories, all of uh, Far East Command minus West India, is all under Japanese control with absolutely zero chance of the Allies um, coming back at all to reclaim any of that territory. Japan with bonuses is up over $90. Germany with bonuses is up over $80. Um, just a ridiculous amount of money. So this will be the second Axis win in a row, I think, as far as... Um, some of the um, highlights or some of the things to take from the game. Um, I just think it's really hard if the Axis um, are aggressive and if uh, roles aren't going against them. This game seems to be set up for, um, obviously, Axis aggression right from the start. And if they do that, I think it uh, makes things difficult for uh, the Allies uh, Britain did engage in a little bit of strategic bombing, maybe should have got into that a little bit earlier in the game. Um, but Germany has three major complexes down, the two they start with, the one they put in Romania, and then when they take some of the cities like Paris and Moscow, there's some minor complexes. So um, I'm not sure how much difference that would have made if the British would have done strategic bombing earlier. Um, the Japanese did not do a J-1 attack. They concentrated mostly on taking out China and then just positioning um, units. They did attack Russia. They stayed away from Mongolia, any territories bordering Mongolia initially, so they did not trigger the Mongolian rule, at least um, when they first attacked Russia. They came up and uh, came into the Soviet Far East and went this way um, inland from um, the Pacific Ocean to avoid the Mongolian rule. At least initially, once they had the Russian units in the Far East taken out, they then did go into a moor. And at that point, it didn't matter that they triggered the Mongolian rule because pretty much all the Russian forces in the Far East were gone at that point. Um, Japan also kept uh, the Australians pretty much bottled up in Sydney pretty much the whole game. And the Far East Command, after getting a few of the Money Islands in the first couple of turns, once Japan did launch their attacks on the Western Allies, they quickly took all of the Money Islands back. And much like the Australians had the Far East Command bottled up in Calcutta most of the game. Uh, the U.S., um, they did do some good things in the Pacific. If you remember, they did attack... Uh, had a, a huge air and naval battle in the Japanese home waters and wiped out all of the Japanese um, planes and ships. 
but they just didn't have any ground units to follow up to get into Tokyo. And by the next turn, Japan had uh, bulked up Tokyo's defenses, so the U.S. wasn't going to be able to um, take out uh, Tokyo. And then it was just kind of a slow pushback with the Japanese um, then allocating most of their resources to building the Navy back up. And the U.S., even with all their money, having to spend it on both um, the European and Pacific side makes things difficult if it happens that one or more of Axis powers are like kind of run wild. Um, if maybe Germany, for instance, is contained, then the U.S. can spend mostly in the Pacific to counter Japan or vice versa. But both Japan and Germany were really um, rolling, especially bringing in all kinds of uh, money. Um, Germans gobbling up Russian territory quite a bit. So um, with two major threats on each side of the globe, it really made it difficult for the U.S. They kind of had to split their money and, and not really concentrate on e um, either side, honestly. Um, the Allies did do good with Italy. Uh, Britain took all of Africa, um, completely knocked the Italians out. Not only did they end up taking Rome here, um, but even before that, Italy was bottled up just in Rome for like two, three turns prior to Rome falling. So Italy uh, was not a factor really right from the start. So the Allies um, did good as far as a Mediterranean strategy and taking Africa. It's just that, uh, and again, maybe that was a mistake on the Allies' side, devoting so much to um, Africa and taking out Italy, because obviously Italy is the weakest of the three Axis powers. Maybe Britain should have spent more money on trying to build up a, a force to land back in Europe to put some pressure on the Germans there so they couldn't, you know, devote most of their resources to taking out Russia. Um, Russia also, much like the U.S., had a couple of big battles that they engaged in. They took, they had a huge tank force built up in Moscow. They took Bryansk and destroyed most of the German um, invasion force. So that delayed the attack into Moscow by a turn or two. Uh, but again, the Western allies couldn't make a dent in Europe whatsoever. So Germany just continued to pump units into Romania, their major factory there. And um, just it was just a delay as far as the fall of Moscow. So that's how things look um, after the second game. Kind of excited to get into a third game and see if we can turn the tide here and maybe come out with an allied victory. Thanks for watching, and we'll be back a little bit later.